Act One of The School for Husbands by Moliere, translated by Henri Van Laun. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dramatis Personae Sagana Rao, read by Nemo. Orista, his brother, read by Todd. Valer, lover to Isabella, read by Peter Tucker. Ergast, servant to Valer, read by Thomas Peter. A magistrate, read by Alan Mapstone. The notary, read by James Curran. Isabella, read by Sonia. Leonor, her sister, read by Leania. Lisette, maid to Isabella, read by Avaï. Stage directions, read by Sandra. Scene, a public place in Paris. The school for husbands, l'école des maris. Act One, Scene One. Scanarel Arist. Pray, brother, let us talk less, and let each of us live as he likes. Though you have the advantage of me in years, and are old enough to be wise, yet I tell you that I mean to receive none of your reproofs, that my fancy is the only counsellor I shall follow, and that I am quite satisfied with my way of living but every one condemns it yes fools like yourself brother thank you very much it is a pleasant compliment i should like to know since one ought to hear everything what these fine critics blame in me that surly and austere temper which shuns all charms of society gives a whimsical appearance to all your actions and makes everything peculiar in you even your dress i ought then to make myself a slave in fashion and not to put on clothes for my own sake would you not my dear elder brother for heaven be thanked so you are to tell you plainly by a matter of twenty years and that is not worth the trouble of mentioning would you not i say by your precious nonsense persuade me to adopt the fashions of those young sparks of yours oblige me to wear those little hats which provide ventilation for their weak brains and that flaxen hair the vast curls whereof conceal the form of the human face those little doublets but just below the arms and those big collars falling down to the navel those sleeves which one sees at table trying all the sauces and those petticoats called breeches those tiny shoes covered with ribbons which make you look like feather-legged pigeons and those large rolls wherein the legs are put every morning as it were into the stocks and in which we see these gallants straddle about with their legs as wide apart as if they were the beams of a mill i should doubtless please you bedizened in this way i see that you wear the stupid gewgaws which it is the fashion to wear we should always agree with the majority and never cause ourselves to be stared at extremes shock and a wise man should do with his clothes as with his speech avoid too much affectation and without being in too great a hurry follow whatever change custom introduces i do not think that we should act like those people who always exaggerate the fashion and who are annoyed that another should go further than themselves in the extremes which they affect but i maintain that it is wrong for whatever reasons obstinately to eschew what every one observes that it would be better to be counted among the fools than to be the only wise person in opposition to every one else that smacks of the old man who in order to impose upon the world covers his gray hairs with a black wig it is strange that you should be so careful always to fling my age in my face 
and that I should continually find you blaming my dress as well as my cheerfulness. One would imagine that old age ought to think of nothing but death, since it is condemned to give up all enjoyment, and that it is not attended by enough ugliness of its own, but must needs be slovenly and crabbed. However that may be, I am resolved to stick to my way of dress. In spite of the fashion, I like my cap so that my head may be comfortably sheltered beneath it, a good long doublet buttoned close, as it should be, which may keep the stomach warm and promote a healthy digestion, a pair of breeches made exactly to fit my thighs, shoes like those of our wise ancestors, in which my feet may not be tortured, and he who does not like the look of me may shut his eyes. Scene 2. Leonor, Isabella, Lisette, Ariste and Scannarelle conversing in an undertone, unperceived. Leonor to Isabella. I take it all on myself, in case you are scolded. Lisette to Isabella. Always in one room, seeing no one. <sighs> Such is his humour. I pity you, sister. Lisette to Leonor. It is well for you, madam, that his brother is of quite another disposition. Fate was very kind in making you fall into the hands of a rational person. It is a wonder that he did not lock me up to-day, or take me with him. I declare I would send him to the devil with his Spanish ruff and... Sganarelle, against whom Lisette stumbles. Where are you going, if I may ask? We really do not know. I was urging my sister to take a walk, and enjoy this pleasant and fine weather, but... Sganarelle, to Leonor. As for you, you may go wherever you please. To Lisette. You can run off. There are two of you together. To Isabella. But as for you, I forbid you, excuse me, to go out. Oh, brother, let them go and amuse themselves. I am your servant, brother. Youth will. Youth is foolish, and old age, too, sometimes. Do you think there is any harm in her being with Leonore? Not so. But with me, I think she is still better. But... But her conduct must be guided by me. In short, I know the interest I ought to take in it. Have I less in her sisters? By heaven! Each one argues and does as he likes. They are without relatives, and their father, our friend, entrusted them to us in his last hour, charging us both either to marry them, or, if we declined, to dispose of them hereafter. He gave us, in writing, the full authority of a father and a husband over them, from their infancy. You undertook to bring up that one. I charged myself with the care of this one. You govern yours at your pleasure. Leave me, I pray, to manage the other as I think best. It seems to me... It seems to me, and I say it openly, that is the right way to speak on such a subject. You let your ward go about gaily and stylishly. I am content. You let her have footmen and a maid. I agree. You let her gad about, love idleness, be freely courted by dandies. I'm quite satisfied. But I intend that mine shall live according to my fancy, and not according to her own, that she shall be dressed in honest serge, and wear only black on holidays, that shut up in the house, prudent and bearing, she shall apply herself entirely to domestic concerns mend my linen in her leisure hours or else knit stockings for amusement that she shall close her ears to the talk of young sparks and never 
go out without someone to watch her in short flesh is weak i know what stories are going about i have no mind to wear horns if i can help it and as her lot requires her to marry me i mean to be as certain of her as i am of myself i believe you have no grounds for hold your tongue i shall teach you to go out without us what sir good heavens madam without wasting any more words i'm not speaking to you for you are too clever do you regret to see isabella with me yes since i must speak plainly you spoil her for me your visits here only displease me and you will oblige me by honouring us no more do you wish that i shall likewise speak my thoughts plainly to you i know not how she regards all this but i know what effect mistrust would have on me though we are of the same father and mother she is not much of my sister if your daily conduct produces any love in her indeed all these precautions are disgraceful are we in turkey that women must be shut up there they say they are kept like slaves this is why the turks are accursed by god our honour sir is very weak indeed if it must be perpetually watched do you think after all that these precautions are any bar to our designs that when we take anything into our heads the cleverest man would not be but a donkey to us all that vigilance of yours is but a fool's notion the best way of all i assure you is to trust us he who torments us puts himself in extreme peril for our honour must ever be its own protector to take so much trouble in preventing us is almost to give us a desire to sin if i were suspected by my husband i should have a very good mind to justify his fears Sganarelle, to arist this my fine teacher is your training and you endure it without being troubled brother her word should only make you smile there is some reason in what she says their sex loves to enjoy a little freedom they are but ill checked by so much austerity suspicious precautions bolts and bars make neither wives nor maids virtuous it is honour which must hold them to their duty not the severity which we display towards them to tell you candidly a woman who is discreet by compulsion only is not often to be met with we pretend in vain to govern all her actions i find that it is the heart we must win for my part whatever care might be taken i would scarcely trust my honour in the hands of one who in the desires which might assail her required nothing but an opportunity of falling that is all nonsense have it so but still i maintain that we should instruct youth pleasantly chide their faults with great tenderness and not make them afraid of the name of virtue leonore's education has been based on these maxims i have not made crimes of the smallest acts of liberty i have always assented to her youthful wishes and thank heaven i never repented of it i have allowed her to see good company to go to amusements balls plays these are things which for my part i think are calculated to form the minds of the young the world is a school which in my opinion teaches them better how to live than any book does she like to spend money on clothes linen ribbons what then i endeavour to gratify her wishes these are pleasures which when we are well off we may permit to the girls of our family her father's command requires her to marry me but it is not my intention to tyrannize over her i am quite aware that our years hardly suit and i leave her complete liberty of choice if a safe income of four thousand crowns a year great affection and consideration for her may in her opinion counterbalance in marriage the inequality of our age she may take me for her husband if not she may choose elsewhere if she can be happier without me i do not object i prefer to see her with another husband rather than her hand should be given to me against her will oh how 
sweet he is all sugar and honey at all events that is my disposition and i thank heaven for it i would never lay down these strict rules which make children wish their parents dead but the liberty acquired in youth is not so easily withdrawn later on all those feelings will please you but little when you have to change her mode of life and why change it why yes i do not know is there anything in it that offends honour why if you marry her she may demand the same freedom which she enjoyed as a girl well, why not and you so far agree with her as to let her have patches and ribbons doubtless to let her gad about madly at every ball and public assembly yes certainly and the beaux will visit at your house what then who will junk it and give entertainments with all my heart and your wife is to listen to their fine speeches exactly and you will look on at these gallant visitors with a show of indifference of course go on you old idiot to isabella get indoors and hear no more of this shameful doctrine scene three ariste sganarelle leonore lisette i mean to trust to the faithfulness of my wife and intend always to live as i have lived how pleased i shall be to see him victimized i cannot say what fate has in store for me but as for you i know that if you fail to be so it is no fault of yours for you are doing everything to bring it about <laughs> laugh on giggler oh what a joke it is to see a railer of nearly sixty i promise to preserve him against the fate you speak of if he is to receive my vows at the altar he may rest secure but i can tell you i would pass my word for nothing if i were your wife we have a conscience for those who rely on us but it is delightful really to cheat such folks as you hush you cursed ill-bred tongue brother you drew these silly words on yourself good-bye alter your temper and be warned that to shut up a wife is a bad plan your servant i am not yours scene four scanarelle alone oh they're well suited to one another what an admirable family a foolish old man with a worn-out body who plays the fop a girl mistress and a thorough coquette impudent servants no wisdom itself could not succeed but would exhaust sense and reason trying to amend a household like this by such associations isabella might lose those principles of her honour which she learned amongst us to prevent it i shall presently send her back again to my cabbages and turkeys scene five valere scanarelle ergast valere behind ergast that is he the argus whom i hate the stern guardian of her whom i adore scanarelle thinking himself alone in short is there not something wonderful in the corruption of manners nowadays i should like to address him if i can get a chance and try to strike up an acquaintance with him scanarelle thinking himself alone instead of seeing that severity prevail which so admirably formed virtue in other days uncontrolled and imperious youth here about assumes valere bows to scanarelle from a distance he does not see that we bow to him perhaps his blind eye is on this side let us cross to the right i must go away from this place life in town only produces in me valere gradually approaching i must try to get an introduction 
Scanarel, hearing a noise. Ha! Huh. I thought someone spoke. Thinking himself alone. In the country, thank heaven, the fashionable follies do not offend my eyes. Ergast, to Valère. Speak to him. What is it? My ears tingle. There, all the recreations of our girls are but. He perceives Valère bowing to him. Do you bow to me? Ergast, to Valère. Go up to him. Scanarel, not attending to Valère. Thither no coxcomb comes. Valère again bows to him. What the deuce? He turns and sees Ergast bowing on the other side. Another? What a great many bows! Sir, my accosting you disturbs you, I fear. That may be. But yet the honour of your acquaintance is so great a happiness, so exquisite a pleasure, that I had a great desire to pay my respects to you. Well and to come and assure you without any deceit that i am wholly at your service i believe it i have the advantage of being one of your neighbours for which i thank my lucky fate that is all right but sir do you know the news going the round at court and thought to be reliable what does it matter to me true but we may sometimes be anxious to hear it Shall you go and see the magnificent preparations for the birth of our Dauphin, sir? If I feel inclined. Confess that Paris affords us a hundred delightful pleasures which are not to be found elsewhere. The provinces are a desert in comparison. How do you pass your time? On my own business. The mind demands relaxation and occasionally gives way by too close attention to serious occupations. What do you do in the evening before going to bed? What I please. Doubtless no one could speak better. The answer is just, and it seems to be common sense to resolve never to do what does not please us. If I did not think you were too much occupied, I would drop in on you sometimes after supper your servant scene six valere ergast what do you think of that eccentric fool his answers are abrupt and his reception is churlish ah oh, i am in a rage what for why am i in a rage to see her i love in the power of a savage a watchful dragon whose severity will not permit her to enjoy a single moment of liberty that is just what is in your favour your love ought to expect a great deal from these circumstances know for your encouragement that a woman watched is half one and that the gloomy ill temper of husbands and fathers has always promoted the affairs of the gallant i intrigue very little for that is not one of my accomplishments i do not pretend to be a gallant but i have served a score of such sportsmen who often used to tell me that it was their greatest delight to meet with churlish husbands who never come home without scolding downright brutes who without rhyme or reason criticise the conduct of their wives in everything and proudly assuming the authority of a husband quarrel with them before the eyes of their admirers one knows they would say how to take advantage of this the lady's indignation at this kind of outrage on the one hand and the considerate compassion of the lover on the other afford an opportunity for pushing matters far enough in a word the surliness of isabella's guardian is a circumstance sufficiently favourable for you but i could never find one moment to speak to her in the four months that i have ardently loved her love quickens people's wits though it has little effect on yours if i had been why what could you have done for one never sees her without that brute in the house there are neither maids nor men servants whom i might influence to assist me by the alluring temptation of some reward then she does not yet know that you love her it is a point on which i am not informed 
wherever the churl took this fair one she always saw me like a shadow behind her my looks daily tried to explain to her the violence of my love my eyes have spoken much but who can tell whether after all their language could be understood it is true that this language may sometimes prove obscure if it have not writing or speech for its interpreter what am i to do to rid myself of this vast difficulty and to learn whether the fair one has perceived that i love her tell me some means or other that is what we have to discover let us go in for a while the better to think over it end of act one Act Two of the School for Husbands by Moliere, translated by Henri Van Laun. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two, Scene One, Isabella Sganarelle. That will do. I know the house and the person simply from the descriptions you have given me isabella aside heaven be propitious and favour to-day the artful contrivance of an innocent love do you say they have told you that his name is valere yes that will do do not make yourself uneasy about it go inside and leave me to act i am going at once to talk to this young madcap isabella as she goes in for a girl i am planning a pretty bold scheme but the unreasonable severity with which i am treated will be my excuse to every right mind scene two sganarelle alone let us lose no time here it is knocks at the door of valere's house who's there why i am dreaming hello i say hello somebody hello i do not wonder after this information that he came up to me just now so meekly but i must make haste and teach this foolish aspirant scene three valere sganarelle ergast sganarelle to ergast who has come out hastily ah, a plague on the lubbery ox do you mean to knock me down coming and sticking yourself in front of me like a post sir i regret to ah you are the man i want i sir you your name is valere is it not yes i am come to speak to you if you will allow me can i have the happiness of rendering you any service no but i propose to do you a good turn that is what brings me to your house to my house sir to your house need you be so much astonished i have good reason for it i am delighted with the honour do not mention the honour i beseech you will you not come in there is no need i pray you enter no i will go no further as long as you stay there i cannot listen to you i will not budge well i must yield quick since this gentleman is resolved upon it bring a chair i'm going to talk standing as if i could permit such a thing what an intolerable delay such incivility would be quite unpardonable nothing can be so rude as not to listen to people who wish to speak to us i obey you then you cannot do better they make many compliments about putting on their hats so much ceremony is hardly necessary will you listen to me undoubtedly and most willingly tell me do you know that i am guardian to a tolerably young and passably handsome girl who lives in this neighbourhood and whose name is isabella yes as you know it i need not tell it to you but do you know likewise that as i find her charming 
i care for her otherwise than his guardian and that she is destined for the honour of being my wife no i tell it you then and also that it is well that your passion if you please should leave her in peace who i sir yes you let us have no dissembling who has told you that my heart is smitten by her those who are worthy of belief be more explicit she herself she she is not that enough like a virtuous young girl who has loved me from childhood she told me all just now moreover she charged me to tell you that since she has everywhere been followed by you her heart which your pursuit greatly offends has only too well understood the language of your eyes that your secret desires are well known to her and that to try more fully to explain a passion which is contrary to the affection she entertains for me is to give yourself needless trouble she you say of her own accord makes you yes makes me come to you and give you this frank and plain message also that having observed the violent love wherewith your soul is smitten she would earlier have let you know what she thinks about you if perplexed as she was she could have found any one to send this message by but that at length she was painfully compelled to make use of me in order to assure you as i have told you that her affection is denied to all save me that you have been ogling her long enough and that if you have ever so little brains you will carry your passion somewhere else farewell till our next meeting that is what i had to tell you valere aside Helgast, what do you say to such an adventure Sganarel, aside retiring see how he is taken aback ergast in a low tone to valere for my part i think that there is nothing in it to displease you that a rather subtle mystery is concealed under it in short that this message is not sent by one who desires to see the love end which she inspires in you Sganarel, aside he takes it as he ought Valère, in a low tone to Ergast, You think it a mystery? Yes. But he is looking at us. Let us get out of his sight. Scene 4. Sganarel alone. How his face showed his confusion. Doubtless he did not expect this message. Let me call Isabella she is showing the fruits which education produces on the mind virtue is all she cares for and her heart is so deeply steeped in it that she is offended if a man merely looks at her scene five isabella scanarel isabella aside as she enters i fear that my lover full of his passion has not understood my message rightly since i am so strictly guarded i must risk one which shall make my meaning clearer here i am returned again well your words wrought their full purpose i have done his business he wanted to deny that his heart was touched but when i told him i came from you he stood immediately dumbfounded and confused i do not believe he will come here any more ah what do you tell me i much fear the contrary and that he will still give us more trouble and why do you fear this you had hardly left the house when going to the window to take a breath of air i saw a young man at yonder turning who first came most unexpectedly to wish me good morning on the part of this impertinent man and then threw right into my chamber a box enclosing a letter sealed like a love letter i meant at once to throw it after him but he had already reached the end of the street 
i feel very much annoyed at it just see his trickery and rascality it is my duty quickly to have this box and letter sent back to this detestable lover for that purpose i need someone for i dare not venture to ask yourself on the contrary darling it shows me all the more your love and faithfulness my heart joyfully accepts this task you oblige me in this more than i can tell you take it then well let us see what he has dared to say to you heavens take care not to open it why so will you make him believe that it is i a respectable girl ought always to refuse to read the letters a man sends her the curiosity which she thus betrays shows a secret pleasure in listening to gallantries i think it right that this letter should be peremptorily returned to valere unopened that he may the better learn this day the great contempt which my heart feels for him so that his passion may from this time lose all hope and never more attempt such a transgression of a truth she is right in this well your virtue charms me as well as your discretion i see that my lessons have borne fruit in your mind you show yourself worthy of being my wife still i do not like to stand in the way of your wishes the letter is in your hands and you can open it no far from it your reasons are too good i go to acquit myself of the task you impose upon me i have likewise to say a few words quite near and will then return hither to set you at rest scene six scanarelle alone how delighted i am to find her such a discreet girl i have in my house a treasure of honour to consider a loving look treason to receive a love letter as a supreme insult and have it carried back to the gallant by myself i should like to know seeing all this if my brother's ward would have acted thus on a similar occasion upon my word girls are what you make them hello knocks at valere's door scene seven sganarel ergast who is there take this and tell your master not to presume so far as to write letters again and send them in gold boxes say also that isabella is mightily offended at it see it has not even been opened he will perceive what regard she has for his passion and what success he can expect in it scene eight valere ergast what has that surly brute just given you this letter sir as well as this box which he pretends that isabella has received from you and about which she says she is in great rage she returns it to you unopened read it quickly and let us see if i am mistaken valere reads this letter will no doubt surprise you both the resolution to write to you and the means of conveying it to your hands may be thought very bold in me but i am in such a condition that i can no longer restrain myself well-founded repugnance to a marriage with which i am threatened in six days makes me risk everything and in the determination to free myself from it by whatever means i thought i had rather choose you than despair yet do not think that you owe all to my evil fate it is not the constraint in which i find myself that has given rise to the sentiments i entertain for you but it hastens the avowal of them and makes me transgress the decorum which the proprieties of my sex require it depends on you alone to make me shortly your own i wait only until you have declared your intentions to me before acquainting you with the resolution i have taken but above all remember that time presses and that two hearts which love each other ought to understand even the slightest hint 
<laughs> well sir is not this contrivance original for a young girl she is not so very ignorant would one have thought her capable of these love stratagems oh, i consider her altogether adorable this evidence of her wit and tenderness doubles my love for her and strengthens the feelings with which her beauty inspires me here comes the dupe think what she will say to him scene nine scanarel valer ergast scanarel thinking himself alone o oh, thrice and four times blessed be the law which forbids extravagance in dress no longer will the troubles of husbands be so great women will now be checked in their demands oh how delighted i am with the king for this proclamation how i wish for the peace of the same husbands that he would forbid coquetry as well as lace and gold or silver embroidery i have bought the law on purpose so that isabella may read it aloud and by and by when she is at leisure it shall be our entertainment after supper perceiving valere well mr sandy here would you like to send again love letters and boxes of gold you doubtless thought you had found some young flirt eager for an intrigue and melting before pretty speeches you see how your presents are received believe me you waste your powder and shot isabella is a discreet girl she loves me and your love insults her aim at someone else and be off yes yes your merits to which every one yields are too great an obstacle sir though my passion be sincere it is folly to contend with you for the love of isabella it is really folly be sure i should not have yielded to the fascination of her charms could i have foreseen that this wretched heart would find a rival so formidable as yourself i believe it now i know better than to hope i yield to you sir and that too without a murmur you do well reason will have it so for you shine with so many virtues that i should be wrong to regard with an angry eye the tender sentiments which isabella entertains for you of course yes yes i yield to you but at least i pray you and it is the only favour sir begged by a wretched lover of whose pangs this day you are the sole cause i pray you i say to assure isabella that if my heart has been burning with love for her these three months that passion is spotless and has never fostered a thought at which her honour could be offended eh? that relying solely on my heart's choice my only design was to obtain her for my wife if destiny had not opposed an obstacle to this pure flame in you who captivated her heart very good that whatever happens she must not think that her charms can ever be forgotten that to whatever decrees of heaven i must submit my fate is to love her to my last breath and that if anything checks my pursuit it is the just respect i have for your merits that is wisely spoken i shall go at once to repeat these words which will not be disagreeable to her but if you will listen to me try to act so as to drive this passion from your mind farewell Ergast to valere the excellent dupe scene ten Sganarel alone i feel a great pity for this poor wretch so full of affection but it is unfortunate for him to have taken it into his head to try to storm a fortress which i have captured scanarel knocks at his door scene eleven scanarel isabella never did lover display so much grief for a love-letter returned unopened at last he loses all hope and retires 
but he earnestly entreated me to tell you that at least in loving you he never fostered a thought at which your honour could be offended and that relying solely on his heart's choice his only desire was to obtain you for a wife if destiny had not opposed an obstacle to his pure flame through me who captivated your heart that whatever happens you must not think that your charms can ever be forgotten by him that to whatever decrees of heaven he must submit his fate is to love you to his last breath and that if anything checks his pursuit it is the just respect he has for my merits these are his very words and far from blaming him i think him a gentleman and i pity him for loving you isabella aside his passion does not contradict my secret belief and his looks have always assured me of its innocence what do you say that it is hard that you should so greatly pity a man whom i hate like death and that if you loved me as much as you say you would feel how he insults me by his addresses but he did not know your inclinations and from the uprightness of his intentions his love does not deserve is it good intentions i ask to try and carry people off is it like a man of honour to form designs for marrying me by force and taking me out of your hands as if i were a girl to live after such a disgrace how yes yes i have been informed that this base lover speaks of carrying me off by force for my part i cannot tell by what secret means he has learned so early that you intend to marry me in eight days at the latest since it was only yesterday you told me so but they say that he intends to be beforehand with you and not let me unite my lot to yours that is a bad case oh pardon me he is eminently a gentleman who only feels towards me he is wrong and this is past joking yes your good nature encourages his folly if you had spoken sharply to him just now he would have feared your rage and my resentment for even since his letter was rejected he mentioned this design which has shocked me as i have been told his love retains the belief that it is well received by me that i dread to marry you whatever people may think and should be rejoiced to see myself away from you he is mad before you he knows how to disguise and his plan is to amuse you be sure the wretch makes sport of you by these fair speeches i must confess that i am very unhappy after all my pains to live honourably and to repel the addresses of a vile seducer i must be exposed to his vexatious and infamous designs against me there fear nothing for my part i tell you that if you do not strongly reprove such an impudent attempt and do not find quickly means of ridding me of such bold persecutions i will abandon all and not suffer any longer the insults which i receive from him do not be so troubled my little wife there i am going to find him to give him a good blowing up tell him at least plainly so that it may be in vain for him to gainsay it that i have been told of his intentions upon good authority that after this message whatever he may undertake i defy him to surprise me and lastly that without wasting any more size or time he must know what are my feelings for you that if he wishes not to be the cause of some mischief he should not require to have the same thing told twice over i will tell him what is right but all this in such a way as to show him that i really speak seriously there i will forget nothing i assure you i await your return impatiently pray make as much haste as you can i pine when i am a moment without seeing you there ducky my heart's delight i will return immediately scene twelve sganarelle alone 
was there ever a girl more discreet and better behaved oh how happy i am and what a pleasure it is to find a woman just after my own heart yes that is how our women ought to be and not like some i know downright flirts who allow themselves to be courted and make their simple husbands to be pointed at all over paris knocks at valere's door hello my enterprising fine gallant scene thirteen valere scanarel ergast sir what brings you here again your follies how you know well enough what i wish to speak to you about to tell you plainly i thought you had more sense you've been making fun of me with your fine speeches and secretly nourish silly expectations look you i wish to treat you gently but you will end by making me very angry are you not ashamed considering who you are to form such designs as you do to intend to carry off a respectable girl and interrupt a marriage on which her whole happiness depends who told you this strange piece of news sir do not let us dissimulate i have it from isabella who sends you word by me for the last time that she has plainly enough shown you what her choice is that her heart entirely mine is insulted by such a plan that she would rather die than suffer such an outrage and that you will cause a terrible uproar unless you put an end to all this confusion if she really said what i have just heard i confess that my passion has nothing more to expect these expressions are plain enough to let me see that all is ended i must respect the judgment she has passed if you doubt it then and fancy all the complaints that i have made to you on her behalf are mere pretenses do you wish that she herself should tell you her feelings to set you right i willingly consent to it follow me you shall hear if i have added anything and if her young heart hesitates between us two goes and knocks at his own door scene fourteen isabella sganarel valere ergast what you bring valere to me what is your design are you taking his part against me and do you wish charmed by his rare merits to compel me to love him and endure his visits no my love your affection is too dear to me for that but he believes that my messages are untrue he thinks that it is i who speak and cunningly represent you as full of hatred for him and of tenderness for me i wish therefore from your own mouth infallibly to cure him of a mistake which nourishes his love isabella to valere what is not my soul completely bare to your eyes and can you still doubt whom i love yes all that this gentleman has told me on your behalf madam might well surprise a man i confess i doubted it this final sentence which decides the fate of my great love moves my feelings so much that it can be no offence if i wish to have it repeated no no such a sentence should not surprise you scanarel told you my very sentiments i consider them to be sufficiently founded on justice to make their full truth clear yes i desire it to be known and i ought to be believed that fate here presents two objects to my eyes who inspiring me with different sentiments agitate my heart one by just choice in which my honour is involved has all my esteem and love and the other in return for his affection 
has all my anger and aversion the presence of the one is pleasing and dear to me and fills me with joy but the sight of the other inspires me with secret emotions of hatred and horror to see myself the wife of the one is all my desire and rather than belong to the other i would lose my life but i have sufficiently declared my real sentiments and languished too long under this severe torture he whom i love must use diligence to make him whom i hate lose all hope and deliver me by a happy marriage from a suffering more terrible than death yes darling i intend to gratify your wish it is the only way to make me happy you shall soon be so i know it is a shame for a young woman so openly to declare her love no no but seeing what my lot is such liberty must be allowed me i can without blushing make so tender a confession to him whom i already regard as a husband yes my poor child darling of my soul let him think then how to prove his passion for me yes here kiss my hand let him without more sighing hasten a marriage which is all i desire and accept the assurance which i give him never to listen to the vows of another she pretends to embrace ganarelle and gives her hand to valer to kiss oh oh my little pretty face my poor little darling you shall not pine long i promise you to valer there say no more you see i do not make her speak it is me alone she loves well madam well this is sufficient explanation I learn by your words what you urge me to do. I shall soon know how to rid your presence of him who so greatly offends you. You could not give me greater pleasure, for, to be brief, the sight of him is intolerable. It is odious to me, and I detest it so much. Uh, uh. Do I offend you by speaking thus? Do I... Heavens, by no means i do not say that but in truth i pity his condition you show your aversion too openly i cannot show it too much on such an occasion yes you shall be satisfied in three days your eyes shall no longer see the object which is odious to you that is right farewell Sganarelle to Valère i pity your misfortune but no you will hear no complaint from me the lady assuredly does us both justice and i shall endeavour to satisfy her wishes farewell poor fellow his grief is excessive stay embrace me i am her second self embraces valere scene fifteen isabella sganarelle i think he is greatly to be pitied not at all for the rest your love touches me to the quick little darling and i mean it shall have its reward eight days are too long for your impatience to-morrow i will marry you and will not invite <gasps> to-morrow you modestly pretend to shrink from it but i well know the joy these words afford you you wish it were already over but let us get everything ready for this marriage isabella aside heaven inspire me with a plan to put it off end of act two act three of the school for husbands by moliere translated by henri van laun this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org act three scene one 
isabella alone yes death seems to me a hundred times less dreadful than this fatal marriage into which i am forced all that i am doing to escape its horrors should excuse me in the eyes of those who blame me time presses it is night now then let me fearlessly entrust my fate to a lover's fidelity scene two scanarelle isabella scanarelle speaking to those inside the house here i am once more to-morrow they are going in my name oh heaven is it you darling where are you going so late you said when i left you that being rather tired you would shut yourself up in your room you even begged that on my return i would let you be quiet till to-morrow morning it is true but but what you see i am confused i do not know how to tell you the reason why whatever can it be a wonderful secret it is my sister who now compels me to go out and who for a purpose for which i have greatly blamed her has borrowed my room in which i have shut her up what could it be believed she is in love with that suitor whom we have discarded with valer desperately her passion is so great that i can compare it with nothing you may judge of its violence by her coming here alone at this hour to confide to me her love and to tell me positively that she will die if she does not obtain the object of her desire that for more than a year a secret intercourse has kept up the ardour of their love and that they had even pledged themselves to marry each other when their passion was new oh the wretched girl that being informed of the despair into which i had plunged the man whom she loves to see she came to beg me to allow her to prevent the departure which would break her heart to meet this lover to-night under my name in the little street on which my room looks where counterfeiting my voice she may utter certain tender feelings and thereby tempt him to stay in short cleverly to secure for herself the regard which it is known he has for me and do you think this i i am enraged at it what said i sister are you mad do you not blush to indulge in such a love for one of those people who change every day to forget your sex and betray the trust put in you by the man whom heaven has destined you to marry he deserves it richly i'm delighted by it finally my vexation employed a hundred arguments to reprove such baseness in her and enable me to refuse her request for to-night but she became so importunate shed so many tears heaved so many sighs said so often that i was driving her to despair if i refused to gratify her passion that my heart was brought to consent in spite of me and to justify this night's intrigue to which affection for my own sister made me assent i was about to bring lucretia to sleep with me whose virtues you extol to me daily but you surprised me by your speedy return no no i will not have all this mystery at my house as for my brother i might agree to it but they may be seen by some one in the street and she whom i am to honour with my body must not only be modest and well-born she must not even be suspected let us send the miserable girl away and let her passion ah uh, you would overwhelm her with confusion and she might justly complain of my want of discretion since i must not countenance her design at least wait till i send her away well do so but above all conceal yourself i beg of you and be content to see her depart without speaking one word to her yes for your sake i will restrain my anger but as soon as she is gone i will go and find my brother without delay i shall be delighted to run and tell him of this business i entreat you then not to mention my name good night for i shall shut myself in at the same time till to-morrow dear 
how impatient i am to see my brother and tell him of his plight the good man has been victimized with all his bombast i would not have this undone for twenty crowns isabella within yes sister i am sorry to incur your displeasure but what you wish me to do is impossible my honour which is dear to me would run too great a risk farewell go home before it is too late there she goes fretting finely i warrant let me lock the door for fear she should return isabella going out disguised heaven abandon me not in my resolve whither can she be going let me follow her isabella aside night at least favours me in my distress sganarelle aside to the gallant's house what is her design scene three valere isabella sganarelle valere coming out quickly yes yes this night i will make some effort to speak to who is there isabella to valere no noise valere i have forestalled you i am isabella sganarelle aside you lie minx it is not she she is too staunch to those laws of honour which you forsake you are falsely assuming her name and voice isabella to valere but unless by the holy bonds of matrimony yes that is my only purpose and here i make you a solemn promise that to-morrow i will go wherever you please to be married to you sganarelle aside poor deluded fool enter with confidence i now defy the power of your duped argus before he can tear you from my love this arm shall stab him to the heart a thousand times scene four sganarelle alone oh i can assure you i do not want to take from you a shameless girl so blinded by her passion i am not jealous of your promise to her if i am to be believed you shall be her husband yes let us surprise him with his bold creature the memory of her father who is justly respected and the great interest i take in her sister demand that an attempt at least should be made to restore her honour hello there knocks at the door of a magistrate scene five sganarelle a magistrate a notary attendant with a lantern what is it your servant your worship your presence in official garb is necessary here follow me please with your lantern bearer we were going this is a very pressing business what is it to go into that house and surprise two persons who must be joined in lawful matrimony it is a girl with whom i am connected in whom under promise of marriage a certain valere has seduced and got into his house she comes of a noble and virtuous family but if that is the business it was well you met us since we have a notary here sir yes a notary royal and what is more an honourable man no need to add that come to this doorway make no noise but see that no one escapes you shall be fully satisfied for your trouble but be sure and do not let yourself be bribed what do you think that an officer of justice what i said was not meant as a reflection on your position i will bring my brother here at once only let the lantern-bearer accompany me aside i am going to give this placable man a treat hello knocks at arist's door scene six arist 
Sganarelle. Who knocks? Why, what do you want, brother? Come, my fine teacher, my superannuated buck. I shall have something pretty to show you. How? I bring you good news. What is it? Where is your Leonor, pray? Why this question? She is, as I think, at a friend's house at a ball. Ah, oh yes. Follow me. You shall see to what ball Missy is gone. What do you mean? You have brought her up very well indeed. It is not good to be always finding fault. The mind is captivated by much tenderness, and suspicious precaution bolts and bars make neither wives nor maids virtuous. We cause them to do evil by so much austerity. Their sex demands a little freedom. Of a verity she has taken her fill of it, the artful girl, and with her virtue has grown very complacent. What is the drift of such a speech? Bravo, my elder brother. It is what you richly deserve. I would not for twenty pistoles that you should have missed this fruit of your silly maxim. Look what our lessons have produced in these two sisters. The one avoids the gallants. The other runs after them. If you will not make your riddle clearer. The riddle is that her ball is at Valère's, that I saw her go to him under cover of night, and that she is at this moment in his arms. Who? Leonor. A truce to jokes, I beg of you. I joke? He is excellent with his joking. Poor fellow. I tell you, and tell you again, that Valère has your Leonor in his house, and that they have pledged each other before he dreamed of running after Isabella. This story is so very improbable. He will not believe it, even when he sees it. I am getting angry. Upon my word, old age is not good for much when brains are wanting. Laying his finger on his forehead. What? Brother, you mean to? I mean nothing upon my soul. Only follow me. Your mind shall be satisfied directly. You shall see whether I am deceiving you, and whether they have not pledged their troth for more than a year past. Is it likely she could thus have agreed to this engagement without telling me? Me, who in everything, from her infancy, ever displayed towards her a complete readiness to please, and who a hundred times protested I would never force her inclinations? Well, your own eye shall judge of the matter. I have already brought here a magistrate and a notary. We are concerned that the promised marriage shall at once restore to her the honor that she has lost. For I do not suppose you are so mean-spirited as to wish to marry her with this stain upon her, unless you have still some arguments to raise you above all kinds of ridicule. For my part, I shall never be so weak as wish to possess a heart in spite of itself. But, after all, I cannot believe. What speeches you make! Come, this might go on forever. Scene 7. Sganarelle, Ariste, a magistrate, a notary. There is no need to use any compulsion here, gentlemen. If you wish to have them married, your anger may be appeased on the spot. Both are equally inclined to it. Valère has already given under his hand a statement that he considers her who is now with him as his wife. The girl? Is within, and will not come out unless you consent to gratify their desires. Scene 8. Valère, a magistrate, a notary, Scanarelle, Ariste. Valère, at the window of his house. No, gentlemen, no man shall enter here until your pleasure be known to me. You know who I am. 
i have done my duty in signing the statement which they can show you if you intend to approve of the marriage you must also put your names to this agreement if not prepare to take my life before you shall rob me of the object of my love no we have no notion of separating you from her aside he has not yet been undeceived in the matter of isabella let us make the most of his mistake Arist to valere but is it leonore hold your tongue but be quiet i want to know again will you hold your tongue i say to be brief whatever the consequence isabella has my solemn promise i also have hers if you consider everything i am not so bad a match that you should blame her what he says is not be quiet i have a reason for it you shall know the mystery to valere yes without any more words we both consent that you shall be the husband of her who is present in your house the contract is drawn up in those very terms and there is a blank for the name as we have not seen her sign the lady can set you all at ease by and by i agree to the arrangement and so do i with all my heart aside we will have a good laugh presently aloud there brother sign yours the honour to sign first but why all this mystery the deuce what hesitation sign you simpleton he talks of isabella and you of leonore are you not agreed brother if it be she to leave them to their mutual promises doubtless sign then i shall do the same so be it i understand nothing about it you shall be enlightened we will soon return exeunt magistrate and notary into valere's house scanarel to arist now then i will give you a cue to this intrigue they retire to the back of the stage scene nine leonore scanarel arist lisette ah oh, what a strange martyrdom what bores all those young fools appear to me i have stolen away from the boar on account of them each of them tried to make himself agreeable to you and i never endured anything more intolerable i should prefer the simplest conversation to all the babblings of these say nothings they fancy that everything must give way before their flax and wigs and think they have said the cleverest witticism when they come up with their silly chafing tone and rally you stupidly about the love of an old man for my part i value more highly the affection of such an old man than all the giddy raptures of a youthful brain but i do not see Sganarel to arist yes so the matter stands perceiving leonore ah there she is and her maid with her leonore without being angry i have reason to complain you know whether i have ever sought to restrain you and whether i have not stated a hundred times that i left you full liberty to gratify your own wishes yet your heart regardless of my approval has pledged its faith as well as its love without my knowledge i do not repent of my indulgence but your conduct certainly annoys me it is a way of acting which the tender friendship i have borne you does not merit i know not why you speak to me thus but believe me i am as i have ever been nothing can alter my esteem for you love for any man would seem to me a crime if you will satisfy my wishes a holy bond shall unite us to-morrow on what foundation then have you brother what did you not come out of valere's house have you not been declaring your passion this very day and have you not been for a year past in love with him who has been painting such pretty pictures of me who has been at the trouble of inventing such falsehoods scene ten isabella valere leonore arist scanarel magistrate notary lisette 
ergast sister i ask you generously to pardon me if by the freedom i have taken i have brought some scandal upon your name the urgent pressure of a great necessity suggested to me some time ago this disgraceful stratagem your example condemns such an escapade but fortune treated us differently choose Ganarel. as for you sir i will not excuse myself to you i serve you much more than i wrong you heaven did not design us for one another as i found i was unworthy of your love and undeserving of a heart like yours i vastly preferred to see myself in another's hands valer to Scanarel. for me i esteem it my greatest glory and happiness to receive her sir from your hands brother you must take this matter quietly your own conduct is the cause of this i can see it is your unhappy lot that no one will pity you though they know you have been made a fool of upon my word i am glad of this this reward of his mistrust is a striking retribution i do not know whether the trick ought to be commended but i am quite sure that i at least cannot blame it her star condemns him to be a cuckold it is lucky for him he is only a retrospective one Scanarel, recovering from the stupor into which she had been plunged no i cannot get the better of my astonishment this faithlessness perplexes my understanding i think that satan in person could be no worse than such a jade i could have sworn it was not in her unhappy he who trusts a woman after this the best of them are always full of mischief they were made to damn the whole world i renounce the treacherous sex for ever and give them to the devil with all my heart well said let us all go to my house come monsieur valere to-morrow we will try to appease his wrath lisette to the audience as for you if you know any churlish husbands by all means send them to school with us end of act three end of the school for husbands by moliere translated by henri van laun